Hey guys, what's up? John from FlyingMikeAlpha.com. Today we're going to go ahead and address a topic a lot of people have questions about, how to log PIC time as a safety pilot, or how to log simulated instrument time as a private pilot when you're working towards that instrument rating, or just trying to build time in a more cost-effective manner so two guys can share in the cost of the airplane and both log time at the same time. Let's take a look. So the whole idea here is for two people to be in the airplane, two private pilots or something like that, not an instructor and a student, and be able for both of them to be logging flight time and logging simulated time, at least for one of them. So you can use that towards getting your instrument rating. This saves a lot of money and you can share the cost of the airplane because you both get to log flight time and one of you is logging simulated instrument time. You can even make it so you log cross country time. So let's take a look at the logbook here and imagine we're going to do two guys on an airplane cross country from Venice on down to La Belle, Florida. It's more than 50 miles and somebody's going to be wearing the foggles. The other guy is going to be PIC. Now let's take a look at the requirements of what it takes to actually be a safety pilot. Now you can't just be yelling up from your bedroom in your mom's basement. Hey mom, can you come be my safety pilot? I want to log some instrument time. Well, that would be awesome. But unfortunately, it doesn't fly. Negative Ghost Rider, you're going to have to have someone else that meets these requirements here. They must be at least a private pilot. They must hold a category and class rating that's applicable to the airplane that you're going to be flying in. So airplane single engine land, if they are a private pilot helicopter, not going to fly. It does not work. They want someone who is competent to fly the airplane. They want somebody who can legally be the pilot in command without you there since they are going to be legally responsible for the safety of the flight while you're flying blind, logging that simulated instrument time under those lovely foggles and or hood. Next, he must or she must occupy the other control seat. So it's not cool if they're just sitting in the back of the airplane, just kind of hanging out while someone else is sitting in the right seat. If they're going to be legally responsible for the flight, they need to be up near the controls and be able to have a set of controls in front of them so they can assume the controls should there be a traffic conflict or a bird or something like that that they need to avoid because they can see and you can't. Lastly, that person has to have a current medical because they are a required crew member now under the FARS because you can't see where you're going. You're required to have somebody there that can and can help you. And that makes them a required crew member. Thus, they must have a medical under FAR 61.3, Part C. Now, Basic Med does qualify for this, so they just have to have a medical. It doesn't have to be a first class. It could be a third class medical. It could be a Basic Med medical. But the whole driver's license thing with a sport pilot, that doesn't work. Okay, they have to have an actual medical for this to apply. So if they qualify under Basic Med or third class medical, that's totally cool. But it's got to be current, and their Basic Med has to be current if they're using that. So to recap here, while well, Casey goes ahead and tries to recover from that unusual attitude in the background there, basically your safety pilot's going to be sitting in the right seat. You're going to be flying the airplane as a private pilot as you normally would from the left. And sometime after takeoff, once you get to a safe altitude, you're going to transfer the controls over to the safety pilot. He's going to fly the airplane for 30 seconds or a minute while you put on the foggles. And then once you're comfortable looking at the instruments and the airplane is stable, you'll transfer the controls back over to you using that three-part exchange of controls. That way, the safety pilot is looking for traffic and you are flying the airplane. So you can fly the airplane, you can be responsible for the radios, you can do everything, but you're not actually the pilot in command of the flight. The safety pilot, the guy in the right seat, is actually legally responsible for the flight. And it's important that both of you agree upon this before takeoff. It has to be something that's agreed upon. You can't just inadvertently make somebody the pilot in command and legally responsible for the entire flight. So the safety pilot takes full legal responsibility, the final authority for the flight, while you are the pilot in command just because you're simply manipulating the flight controls. So since you're the sole manipulator of the flight controls, you get to log pilot in command time, but the safety pilot is actually the pilot in command. So you're just acting as pilot in command where the safety pilot is the real pilot in command. Hopefully that's not too discombobulated. Now when it comes to logging this time, that's where it gets a little confusing. It's pretty much a standard flight log entry, but the best way to do these flights are in a way that you could build cross-country time while also building simulated instrument time towards the instrument rating. So let's say you take off on this flight from Venice to La Belle and then back to Venice, and it's a cross-country flight more than 50 miles. You, the guy in the left seat who's going to be wearing the hood, goes ahead and does the takeoff at cruise altitude, transfer, transfers the controls 
puts on the hood, and then starts flying the airplane again. Now, all of a sudden, the guy in the right seat begins logging pilot and command time. You've logged time since engine start, basically. He's just started logging his time. Then you fly along, and also it's important to note that you just started logging hood time or simulated instrument time. Then you fly along, you transfer controls back, you take the hood off, you do the landing. Whoever does the landing is really who's getting credit for the cross country. So the one guy should be doing the takeoff and landing. That way, that one guy gets credit for the cross country time. There's no way for both of you to get credit for the cross country time. It's not possible. So you have to decide who on that flight that day is going to get credit for the cross country time. Obviously, whoever's wearing the hood gets credit for the simulated instrument time in this column. Next, you're going to go ahead and take off. Same process again. You're going to do the takeoff at cruise altitude, transfer the controls, put the hood on, and then once again, you start logging simulated instrument time. He again starts logging time himself. But it's important to note that when you come up here at the end and you've got 2.2 total time, 1.7 under the hood, he only logs 1.7 total time in his logbook, and of course he logs no simulated instrument time in this scenario because he was never under the hood. He was just simply sitting there looking out the window being a safety pilot. You are logging the 2.2 total in the single engine airplane, total flight time, all that, because you were always touching the controls or... Um, for the vast majority of the time you were touching the controls. And you also had the hood on for 1.7, so you log 1.7 simulated instrument time. You log the time that you were controlling the airplane solely by reference to instruments per the FARs. Now, hopefully this gives you a little bit better understanding of the idea of a safety pilot. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if someone's going to qualify as your safety pilot, they're going to need to be able to be the pilot in that airplane by themselves as if you weren't there. So let's say you're going to go up in a Skyhawk 172. If the other guy is legal to go take that 172 solo by himself and fly with passengers, so he's a fully qualified private pilot with a valid medical and he's current and all that, then and he can act as pilot in command, then he can be your safety pilot too. At the end of the day, once you fill out logbooks together, make sure you write down each other's names and your logbook and write down in the remarks section, safety pilot was so-and-so and kind of the general idea of what you were doing. You were building cross country and simulated instrument time. And that's all you need. You just need their name. Don't need their certificate number or anything. Don't need it to be signed by them. They're not a CFI. And then of course you just sign at the bottom of the page as you always do. And that makes it an official record. Hopefully that clears up how to log simulated instrument time and what conditions you have to be under to legally be able to do it. If you have any questions at all, leave them in the comments below. Let us know in the comments below too if you've ever logged simulated instrument time with another pilot and what's the longest flight you've done with another pilot under the hood together, building time when you're building up towards uh, your commercial or towards your instrument rating. Just leave that in the comments below there. We'll see who wins. As always, thanks so much for watching. Make sure you check out our Patreon page, subscribe to our channel, like this video, and share it with all your friends. And as always, if you can't fly every day, then fly at MikeAlpha.com. We'll see you all next time.